This is Football Night in America, served by Applebee's. Time for your Week 17 recap. Maria Taylor alongside Tony Dungy, Jason Garrett, and Mike Florio. And there's only one week left for teams that are still jockeying for playoff position. Uh, but let's break down what we saw in Week 17. And let's start with the Patriots getting a victory over Miami. Obviously, it was much needed, but we saw Teddy Bridgewater going down. Tua Tonga Vailoa was in concussion protocol. So that meant that Skylar Thompson had to come in. And ultimately, Miami didn't have enough firepower to get the win. No, they didn't. And... You know, it's just been a shame. Five weeks ago, Miami's riding high. I'm talking about Tua for possibly MVP of the league. He goes down, and it's been downhill from there. They went into this game thinking they're still going to attack with Teddy Bridgewater, that injured Patriots secondary. Then he gets banged up. Just no continuity in the Miami offense. You know, the key for teams is you have to understand that the only thing that matters is what you do now. I mean, it's hard. They've lost five games in a row, a tough loss there. They have the quarterback situation going on, but they have to take care of their business this week. Somehow they got to clean the slate against the Jets and go win a ball game. Now the Jets are out of it, and the Jets have to clean the slate too, and they got to you know, end the season the right way, play for pride. But there's a lot at stake for Miami. The quarterback situation makes it real challenging. Mm-hmm. Something tells me the Jets would be okay with spoiling something for the Patriots. It might, they might be okay with that. No doubt. Uh, <laughs> but for Miami, um, obviously losing five straight is not what you want to see. Uh, what was your biggest takeaway from the matchup, Mike? Well, you know, that offense that Mike McDaniel brought from San Francisco is so heavily premised on the running game. And they begin their game planning by figuring out how they can attack a given defense with the run. And the run game just wasn't there the way it needed to be, especially without your starting quarterback. Now, that's credit to the New England defense. And the New England team just needed something. They've had these crazy losses. It's been disappointing. They have not lived up to the standard that Bill Belichick has set. And when you're ready to write them off, they find a way to win. But the Dolphins are really going to have their hands full. And, and they need help now to, to turn it around. And when you go from 8-3 and three to 8-8, eight and eight, that's, that's how it should be. You shouldn't have an easy path to the postseason. Okay, well, speaking of writing people off, we were watching the Buccaneers and the Panthers play, and um, Tom Brady was down 21-10. to 10. Anyone could have easily wrote him off. We didn't, because we're smarter than that, obviously. Uh, but we saw him connect three times with Mike Evans. The offense got going, Mike Florio. They ultimately get the win. They win the NFC South in just a position that we didn't know we'd be in when we got to the postseason or close to the postseason. And, and here's the key. The records go out the window when it's time to play in the playoffs. The Buccaneers will actually be one seed higher than they were two years ago when they won the whole thing. And Tom Brady walks through the door with 47 career playoff (laughs) games. That is a ton of experience. He doesn't freak out in those moments. And you see him find a way. He finds a way. And he's not just barely holding on. He had 432 passing yards today. He's eight completions short of the record he set last year for an entire season. I mean, You know, most people retire from football because they can't do it anymore, not because they don't want to do it anymore. He can still do it, and he's proving it week in and week out. It's not as pretty in the first three quarters as it used to be, but it's pretty darn effective when it needs to be. Yeah, and and here's what Tampa has, and Mike's right. Throw out the record. Forget about all that. It's been ugly football, but they have a defense that can stop the run when they're healthy and they're getting healthy. They have guys who can rush the passer. And they have star players on offense who can make big plays. And in the playoffs, maybe that's all you need. One or two big plays from Mike Evans or Chris Godwin and stout defense, and you can win playoff games. They have to feel great about what happened today. It was a struggle for a while, but the defense stepped up. And to get Mike Evans back and to score three touchdowns, and it feels like Brady and Evans going again, they got to have a lot of confidence going into the playoffs. And uh, he doesn't get – get freaked out in any situation. No. <laughs> you know, sometimes he shows frustration, but as Mike said, he's played great. He threw for 400 yards again today. But let, let's be fair. Now, 200 of them were freebies just throwing the ball up to Mike Evans. <laughs> yeah, coach right. Five <laughs> yards behind the defense but unfortunately, when they're ahead. <laughs> they count those, Coach. Oh, yeah, <laughs> brother, they count. Yeah, they had touchdown passes of 30, a 50-plus, a 60-plus yarder. And remember, coming into the game, Mike Evans had only caught three, caught three touchdown passes. So, honestly, it was good to see that connection really working especially as we get closer to the postseason what are the chances that you give Brady and and the Bucks that we saw in week 17 I'll tell you what they're going to play the first game at home they'll be very very tough to beat doesn't matter who goes in there and then you you got to win on the road but if you want to win on the road in the playoffs who would you rather take than Tom Brady <laughs> exactly right and uh 
You said it, Coach. I think more than anything else, that defense emerging lately really gives them a chance. Your thoughts on the playoffs of the playoff chances for the Bucks, Mike Florio? Oh, I, I think that they will do better than we ever would have expected that they will do because of Tom Brady's experience and because of the fact, as Coach said, they're getting healthy at the right time. It doesn't matter if you've been banged up all year. If you're getting healthy, as January rolls around, you're in a position to play your best football in the playoffs. All right, so the Bucks won the NFC South. That means they get to host a playoff game. And Tom Brady's just won 19 division titles. No big deal. No one's counting. <laughs> all right, let's talk about the Giants because they did something they haven't done in a while. They clinch a playoff berth for the first time since 2016. First of all, congratulations, Giants. They got to feel good. It, it really should be. You know, you go through a coaching change. Brian Dable comes in, and you think, well, I've got to establish myself and my culture. And usually it takes a while. You know that. I know that. But they did it in one year. It, it's Giants football, and we've been uh, kind of marveling at it. Coach, you and I have talked about this all year long. Being a head coach is a leadership position first, and his leadership of that organization has been outstanding. They made a lot of hard decisions with personnel, but they got themselves to a point where they addressed the issues on the team. Mm. They drafted an, an offensive tackle. They got some veteran offensive linemen. Saquon Barkley's back. That's made a difference. But Daniel Jones has been fantastic all year long for them. Mike Florio, is Brian Dayball your coach of the year? Well, there's a lot of guys who have done a great job this year, and he's definitely in the mix. And he deserves consideration because you consider what the expectations of the Giants were going into the season. Nobody <laughs> would have thought that the Giants would rise up and get a playoff berth, and that's a credit to Brian Dayball. You know, every time the Giants win a game, I see Dave Gettleman's name trending on Twitter, and it's not because people are praising him for putting a great roster together. It's because Brian Dayball came in there and took a team that had a ton of weaknesses, and they still don't have a receiver that anybody's ever heard of who only pays casual attention to football, and they still are finding a way to get it done, and that is a credit to Dayball. All right, let's credit also Aaron Rodgers and this Packers team because they are a win and in scenario against Detroit in week 18 away from making it to the playoffs. When there was a time they were 4-8, and eight, they had a 1-7 and seven stretch throughout this season. I can't believe we're saying it, but that's exactly where they sit heading into week 18. We saw them play Detroit earlier in the year. We all sat here and said, we've never seen Aaron Rodgers play this poorly. Just bad decisions, interceptions in the red zone. Nothing was going right. And they turned it around. They uh, started playing better offensively, but defensively, more aggressive, taking the ball away. And they look like a different team now. Yeah, you know, th this word swagger that people throw around, they're getting a little of their swagger back. The quarterback has a better expression on his face. He's making some plays. But more than anything for me, it's the defense. The defense struggled through the middle part of this season, and they're playing better. Jair Alexander challenged Justin Jefferson. I'm going to shut you down. They're playing with some confidence, with some stuff in their neck, and it's showing up in their performance. How much confidence must they have had to him say <laughs> That was a fluke. Was, Justin Jefferson, you're a fluke. Yeah. We're going to shut you down. And yeah. then go out and do it. No, I mean, but we're watching it early. Yeah. He makes the, the, the pass break up early on. And Jair gets up and does the gritty across the field. We looked at each other <laughs> like, like oh, that's early. I don't think Whoa. that's a good idea. <laughs> hey, it held up the rest of the game. Yeah, they gave up over 100 yards receiving to Justin Jefferson in week one. He was held to one reception and 15 yards. And that was after Jair, Jair Alexander said it was a fluke. So maybe he was right. But what's your takeaway to what we've seen about the Green Bay Packers? Um, so far as we end, or the end of the season here, Mike Florio. This is something that Chris Sims and I talked about on PFT Live before the season started. And I'm a firm believer that the Packers can be more dangerous as a low seed than they have been in recent years as a high seed. When they go in as the number one seed, they seem very tight. They seem nervous. They've got a lot to lose. Aaron Rodgers seems more concerned about not making a mistake than about going for the victory. Now you come in, if they get in, as the seventh seed. Well, back in 2010, his third year as a starter, they got in as the sixth seed, and they only ran the table with wins at Philly, at Atlanta, and then they won at Chicago to go to the Super Bowl in Dallas and win it. And, and I just think that looseness that comes from getting in by the skin of your teeth, if they get in, they still may not get in, but if they get in, I think they're very dangerous because they're not going to be tight. They're going to be loose. And that makes all the difference in the world when you're talking about playoff football. Mm -hmm. You can be the underdog. No target on your back. You're just like, oh, no one expected us to be here. Now we have an opportunity to prove who we really are. All right, we got Steve Kornacki in the building to break down our NFC playoff picture. Take it away, Steve. Yeah, and it's interesting. All the talk about the Packers, but right now it's actually Seattle 
that is sitting in that number seven spot. You got a three-way tie there, and the way the complicated tie-breaking formula works, Seattle in this three-way tie has the seventh seed at the moment, and Seattle's playing the going nowhere LA Rams next week. So <laughs> Seattle could absolutely finish nine and eight on the year. So why doesn't that put them at a better than 19% chance of making the playoffs? Here's how it works. Green Bay is hosting Detroit. Detroit has to go into Lambeau next week. If Green Bay wins that game, they obviously go to nine and eight. Obviously, that jumps Detroit, and now you got a two-way tie, Green Bay and Seattle. And now the tie-breaking formula changes because it's gone from three to two teams. And in the two-team tiebreaker, it's going to be the conference record. Better conference record gets it. And Green Bay is 7-5 and five in the NFC, would be 7-5. and five. Seattle would be 6-6. Six and six. So Green Bay, just by winning next week, would jump into that seventh spot and would secure the final playoff spot. That's why Seattle needs to beat the Rams, and they also need Detroit to beat Green Bay. That's how Seattle gets in. In Detroit, they have to go into Lambeau and get the win, and then they need Seattle to lose. Because remember, Detroit lost to Seattle during the regular season. That's the only path for the Lions. So it's the Packers right now who have by far the cleanest path to the playoffs. And that Packer win today over Minnesota, that demolition of Minnesota, it knocked the Vikings from two to three. Niners beat uh, the uh, Vegas Raiders. The Niners moved to two. And they may not be done yet. San Francisco plays the also going nowhere Arizona Cardinals next week. If they get that, they go 13 and four. Philly plays the Giants. If Philly loses to the Giants next week, Niners 13 and four, Philly 13 and four. Tiebreaker goes to the Niners. They could get the one seed still. Wow, the Brock Purdy led Niners could have the one seed. That's a pretty impressive season for the San Francisco 49ers. All right, one of my New Year's resolutions is to really learn how to be Steve Kornacki and do the big board, <laughs> but I'm not going to hold myself to it. But we do have some New Year's resolutions for some other teams that we've been watching. Let's start with the Jets, who were eliminated. That's 12 straight seasons without making the playoffs. That's the longest streak in the NFL. What would be the New Year's resolution? My New Year's resolution from the Jets is I'm going to take a quarterback and stick with him for three or four years and let him develop. Yeah. I think stick with the overall plan. They're building a good team there. They showed that they can win. They have to get the quarterback situation resolved. That's the resolution. Mm, Mike? <laughs> uh, the best resolution, frankly, would be for owner Woody Johnson to sell the team, but we know that's Ooh. not going to happen. <laughs> oh, um, so I, I'm, but look, how many teams are brought down by the fact that they have chronically bad ownership? You see the revolving door all the time. They get impatient, and I'm setting this up as his resolution should be not to sell the team because he's not going to, but to stick with Joe Douglas as the GM, stick with Robert Sala as the head coach, give them time to make their decisions and continue a team that's on a good trajectory. The, the season was still much better than anyone would have expected, even though they didn't make the playoffs. Okay, what about the commanders? What New Year's resolutions are we giving them? For me, I think my resolution for the commanders would be I'm going to build this team differently than most teams do. I'm going to build around my defense and running game and let the quarterback be a complimentary piece and not try to get a star quarterback at that position. Boy, that's interesting. I was going to say kind of the same thing. I, I do think they have a lot of foundational cornerstone players on defense. They have to get the quarterback thing resolved. If you look at what they've done in recent years, it's Wentz, it's Fitzpatrick, it's Alex Smith. There's all these different guys they've brought in. I'd like to see them draft someone young and stick with him. Maybe have a veteran play for a little bit until the next quarterback is ready to be the quarterback for the commanders. Mike? Oh, here's another one where I say the owners can sell the team, but I think we already checked that box. I think that process is already in motion. But I, I think it's also important to stick with Ron Rivera. Every once in a while when I see people put the list together of vacancies that may arise, as they inevitably will after the season ends, the commanders are on that list. Why? Ron Rivera is the best thing that organization has going for it. He has kept that ship as steady as possible through all of the dysfunction that was a distraction for the players this year. We heard it from the players themselves, and he still kept it moving in the right direction. So I'd be very fascinated to keep him around. And also, if Jack Del Rio is still there as a defensive coordinator, I'd want to know what he thinks about Derek Carr, because he coached him to some pretty good performances back in 2016-ish in Oakland at the time. 
Maybe Carr's the answer at quarterback for the commanders going forward. All right, interesting you bring up Derek Carr. Let's talk about the Raiders. Jared Siddham did his best after Carr was benched, but still they lose to San Francisco. They're eliminated from playoff contention. So what would be their New Year's resolution? Mine for them would be get Josh Jacobs signed. He's a great back. Mm -hmm. Josh McDaniels knows how to orchestrate run offenses, build it around him, get him signed, get some stability and continuity in that organization. This team went backwards. They made the playoff last year. Tumultuous year, Rich Passaccia did a fantastic job leading them. Josh McDaniel comes in and they've, they've gone the other way. The quarterback thing is not resolved. We have to resolve that situation going forward. I don't know if Jared Stidham is the guy going forward, but that has to be addressed. Mike? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the easy resolution is don't get cute with the Derek Carr situation. Don't try to work out a trade. There's too many moving parts, too many things that have to happen, too much money that comes due weeks before a trade can be officially finalized, too much risk it all falls through. Just cut him, move on, clean slate, and then let Josh McDaniels get whoever he thinks is going to run his system best. Maybe it's Jared Stidham. Maybe it's Tom Brady. Maybe it's Jimmy Garoppolo. There's guys out there that Josh McDaniels has coached and knows and could maybe give us a little more what we saw today. A team that gave the 49ers a real scare. All right, so Mike Florio's New Year's resolutions, two owners to sell their teams <laughs> and one quarterback to get cut and more move two. forward. <laughs> we, we, we limited it to two. <laughs> screwed. Yeah. Sure. You know, M Mike mentioned it, but Jimmy Garoppolo could fit in all of those places. Mm -hmm. Jets, commanders, raiders. I mean, he's an answer. He ain't staying in San Francisco. It'll be an interesting offseason for sure, but we still got to finish our regular season. Week 18 is going to be a fun one. Still so much to play for and decisions to be made on the playoffs. We'll see you on Football Night in America because we got to break it all down for you. Tell you how the postseason will go. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.